The Aboriginal people uh, living in this continent that we call Australia have been here for a very, very long time. So illustrated by the many dozens of different language and cultural groups uh, that have developed around the country, uh, you can see that over the, the tens of thousands of years, uh, this has become a very uh, rich and diverse community. The uh, first European contact with the indigenous population of Australia was in the very early 1600s, only a few years before Galileo first turned his telescope to the night sky in Italy. And over the last uh, 200 years, uh, since the commencement of uh, permanent occupation by Europeans and others, a significant uh, gap has developed between indigenous and non-indigenous communities. So in that 200 years, as uh, Australia has grown enormously wealthy, primarily through things like mining and agriculture, uh, th this gap has developed. I'm showing here just a few uh, statistics that come from uh, 49 metrics that are recorded regularly in a, a very nice report from the Australian uh, Productivity Commission called Overcoming Indigenous Advantage. So take a second to digest these numbers. As a scientist, I find myself often uh, faced with examining very subtle differences between two sets of data. Rarely in science are you ever faced with uh, differences this starkly especially when you take these statistics and uh, convert them into human terms, and especially when you see uh, the consequences of these, these differences, especially in uh, some of the remote communities where you really see the, the on-the-ground challenges that are being faced. So I'm not a social scientist. I, I, I'm not a historian. I, I find this uh, sort of engaging in this debate a little bit awkward. I'm obviously not an indigenous person. I'm not a politician. But I do find the scale of the, the challenge and the issues overwhelming. As a scientist and a, a person, I want to find a way to uh, contribute positively to this debate. The, uh, the idea that I think is worth sharing today is that science can play a really interesting role in uh, helping drive uh, creative activities that, uh, that work towards reconciliation in this country. So I want to talk about that idea and illustrate it uh, by talking about one particular project that I've been involved in. My science is uh, astronomy, radio astronomy. So uh, my team and myself are building massive radio telescopes up in the Murchison area of Western Australia. Uh, roughly 700 kilometres north of here. This is, in fact, the, uh, the telescope that we've, we've only just completed and formally launched in, a, in an event last Friday. This is called the Murchison Wide Field Array. Uh, it's a low-frequency radio telescope uh, that's a precursor for the, the much, much larger square kilometre array. I'm sure many of you have heard of that. So this project is being pursued on uh, the land of the Wajidi Yamaji people. Uh, everything that we do uh, out on that land is um, in close collaboration with uh, the Wajidi Yamaji people and we operate under an indigenous land use agreement. It's a very uh, beautiful country. It's, as you can see, flat, pristine. It's extraordinarily quiet. Uh, it's a really beautiful place. Murchison Shire has about the geographic area of the country of the Netherlands and has a population of about 100 people. That's why we're doing what we're doing out there. There's no people with devices with uh, wireless and uh, cars and industry. It's an extraordinarily quiet and beautiful place. Uh, so this connection with, with the land uh, where we're building the radio telescopes uh, has naturally lent itself to a, a very close engagement with uh, the Wajidi Yamaji people. So back in 2009, uh, which was the International Year of Astronomy, uh, we, we kicked off a project called Ilgarajiri, which in the Wajidi Yamaji language means things belonging to the sky. 
the idea here was to bring together two groups of people who wouldn't typically normally closely interact. Those groups being indigenous artists from around the Geraldton and the Murchison area and uh, astronomers and astrophysicists. So the idea was to get these people together and explore our different perceptions of the, the universe and the night sky. The, uh, the night sky is not the domain of any one person or group of people. Um, it's one of the few common points of reference for the entire human race. It's part of our shared heritage. Virtually everyone has looked up at the sky at some point and wondered about what are those things? What is the universe? Why are we here? It's not something that can be owned and it defies ownership. Uh, the night sky, therefore, was a very non-controversial starting point for our project. So a very different starting point to, say, talking about land rights or the convoluted history of the last 200 years. So here was an opportunity to get people together to talk about um, this shared heritage and our different views. So we went out to uh, uh, Bulardi Station at the Murchison, uh, which is where we're building these radio telescopes. Uh, we had uh, about uh, 15 indigenous artists and we had uh, three or four uh, astrophysicists. We walked over the country and we learnt a lot about the connection between the people and the country and talked a lot about uh, what we were doing, the, the telescope, and the really interesting um, overlay of this incredibly modern technology that's examining objects in the early universe 13 billion years ago, the first stars and galaxies after the Big Bang, and its place within this incredibly ancient and beautiful landscape. So there's some really interesting discussions simply around that. Um, the real action was when the sun started to go down and we built a campfire and we had the opportunity to sit around the campfire and uh, talk to each other about the stars. So this is a, this is a, a picture of us around that campfire um, up at Bilardi Station. Now there, there, must be some, um, there must be some astronomers in the audience. Um, I hope you can see the, the image there, but can anyone spot any famous constellations in that image? Just yell out. Orion, yeah, nicely done. Anything else? Maybe it's a little bit hard to see. But yeah, Orion is a very famous constellation. In the Western mythology, Orion is a hunter. And just to guide your eye, that's a very uh, schematic version of Orion with his arms and legs. The Western mythology has Orion chasing uh, a group of young women across the sky, uh, the Seven Sisters. Uh, we, we, we know them in the, in the Greek mythology as the Pleiades. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see on this uh, image because they're just setting below the horizon at the time that this photograph was taken. But there is the, there is the, the Seven Sisters. So Orion the hunter is chasing these Seven Sisters across the sky. What was amazing in our discussions was um, the indigenous Australian view of this part of the sky and a really incredible similarity in that the indigenous people also consider the Pleiades a group of seven sisters completely independently. Not only that, uh, these uh, seven sisters are also pursued across the sky in the indigenous story by a hunter, but not Orion. Uh, not the stars we know as Orion, but the stars that we know as Taurus uh, represent the hunter in the indigenous culture uh, because the stars uh, look like the, uh, the head of an arrow or a head of a spear. And that represents the hunter chasing the, the seven sisters across the sky. I can tell you that the purpose of the chase is the same in both stories, um, but it would not be appropriate for me to uh, talk about it here. You can go home and look that up. But this incredible uh, similarity between vastly different cultures with vastly different histories, both independently came up with the same story of the, the same part of the sky. So discussions like that really, um, really emerged once we, once we started to uh, sit down and talk to each other under the stars. 
and many of you I'm sure have had similar experiences where you're sitting under the night sky, particularly someplace like uh, Bulati, where the horizon is flat, there, there are no towns, there are no lights, it is completely uh, dark, the, the sky is beautifully clear and you, you feel just completely drawn in and immersed in the universe. The stars are like you can uh, reach out and grab them. So this is the, this is the, uh, the telescope that we've, we've, we're building and it's a time-lapse uh, photography of the night sky. So this is the, the, the type of view that we were getting watching this great celestial canvas sort of slowly scroll across uh, the, the biggest screen on Earth. And in that environment, people open up, people start talking to each other, uh, people start sharing their stories. And that's exactly what happened. Another amazing story that we, we talked through was the, uh, the story of the emu. So this is, a, this is a, a constellation or star pattern that's completely unique to the indigenous people of Australia. There's no equivalent in the Western mythology. That's because the star pattern is made up not of the connections between stars, but made up of the outline of uh, the dark patches that run along the centre of the Milky Way galaxy. So when you go and look at the Milky Way, uh, you trace the outline of these dark pa patches and it makes this incredible uh, picture of an emu. And I'd never seen this. And you have to be out in a dark location to see this. But once it's pointed out to you, it's absolutely astonishing. It's uh, an absolute dead ringer for an emu. And whereas the western constellations are sort of this big on the sky, the emu takes up half the sky, stretches from the, the zenith all the way to the horizon. The really amazing thing about the emu is that in the autumn uh, period, straight after the sun sets, uh, the emu is rising in the east and looks for all the world like it's sitting on a nest. And it turns out that this is exactly the time of year when you go out and hunt for emu eggs. So when you see the emu sitting on the horizon on the nest straight after sunset, you know it's time to go and collect emu eggs. This is just an astonishing um, coincidence or, or what, I'm, I'm not so sure. But when it was explained to me, um, I had that really sudden flash of uh, meaning, I guess, where lots of things fit together. And it, it brought home to me that science and art and culture and all these things are really much closer uh, in terms of generating ideas than, than most people think. So it was exactly the same feeling that I get when I take some data and take some theory and put them together and, and things work. There was just this amazing flash of meaning in, in this explanation of the emu and its connection to the, to the land and to the people and to the animals. It all came together. So uh, this occupied us for hours and I was sitting around and talking, uh, sharing our stories. And everyone went away incredibly energised, both, both the, uh, the scientists and the artists. Over the coming months, the artists uh, went away and produced over 150 original pieces of art based on the experience. So this included uh, paintings that involved the, the uh, traditional indigenous stories of the night sky, so the Seven Sisters, uh, the Emu, and, and, and other stories, but also contained a lot of uh, pieces that were inspired by the interaction with the scientists. So we'd taken telescopes with them and they'd seen Jupiter and Saturn and star clusters through the telescopes. And we talked about radio waves propping, propagating through space. And all of these subjects were picked up by the artists and, and produced in these absolutely incredible uh, works of art, some of which um, you can see here on the slide. The, um, the artwork was then curated into an exhibition um, of around about, uh, well, varied between sort of 20 and 50 pieces. Uh, this exhibition opened in Geraldton. Uh, it came to Perth, it went to Canberra, it went to Cape Town, Washington DC, 
Den Haag in the Netherlands, Berlin and Brussels over the last few years. So we've had a global tour of this um, artwork inspired by uh, indigenous and non-indigenous astronomy. And something really interesting has happened as uh, that exhibition has travelled and the artists and the astronomers have travelled with it. Uh, the discussion has become a lot deeper between those groups. So now we spend a lot of time talking about the value of different types of knowledge, uh, the, the, the cultural value in different societies, and really uh, some of the very big challenges in preserving, in particular, Australian Indigenous culture. So this has been a, a really uh, nice thing that over time has uh, been expressed through our work. And uh, we've been incredibly privileged to be able to bring not only the art uh, to the people of Western Australia and Australia and the world, but also these messages. So, so what are, what's the bottom line here? What are the ideas worth spreading? Well, he, here science and art bring Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people together in a very positive way, with a very interesting and unique starting point for the discussion. That really kicked off our relationship as the relationship has built and grown and trust has been established. Those discussions have become a lot deeper and we've been able to propagate those discussions out uh, all over the world. So I'd argue that uh, in a very meaningful way uh, those, rec those reconciliation goals have, have been advanced by this work. I, I can see no reason why this model could not extend to other areas geology, botany, biodiversity, marine science, the weather. I think there's a pretty long list. So I'm very happy to have been part of this project and I think science has an interesting role to play. But I think probably the deeper message and the deeper idea is that it doesn't matter who you are or what you do. Everyone, I think, with a little bit of thought and work can incorporate the goals of reconciliation into their everyday lives. Thank you very much.